Well, Maria, you want to get started? I will. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Maria Dennison, and I'm the Regional Director for the Small Business Development Center for, out of Seward County Community College in Liberal, Kansas. And I want to welcome all of you to today's webinar, The Employer's Guide to COVID-19. Uh, the purpose of this webinar is to provide a walkthrough of the basics of today's employment situation in regard to the pandemic. And it's meant to provide a practical workspace guidance for um, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, uh, some guidance on workplace law, best practices, and an OSHA deep dive. It's also a platform for employers to ask questions on how COVID-19 affects small business. Um, our presenter today is Tim Davis with Castangi Brooks Smith and Profit. Um, I came to know Tim through our SHRM, which is a Society of Human Resource Management. He is one of our trainers and just a trusted partner of the organization. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Tim to let him give you a brief bio and to get us started. Tim? Absolutely. Thank you, Maria. And, and uh, welcome everybody who's able to join. I'm going to be very brief in my bio. Uh, and I'm going to currently leave this first screen up here as we do the introduction. Uh, my name is Tim Davis. I am a partner at Constanji Brooks Smith and Profit. My contact information, if you have follow-up questions or concerns that you need to discuss specific to your organization after we get off of this, th then please don't hesitate to use those numbers. I'm coming to you today from our office uh, in the Kansas City area. I live in Overland Park, Kansas, but uh, I am currently under a quarantine. For those of you who haven't seen what's happened in Kansas City, we do have a shelter of home order here, uh, but I am able to come into my office to maintain a, a steady connection. So that's where I'm at today, overlooking downtown Kansas City, which is, is, is a ghost town like I've never seen. So it's very interesting. One thing I want everybody to look at is to look at the date in the bottom right-hand corner of your slide. This law is moving so fast, and the changes in our economy and the world are moving so fast including the CARES Act, which we anticipate being signed into law sometime today or tomorrow, which will provide significant opportunities for almost everybody, I would assume, on this call to obtain funding and, and, and compensation from the federal government to get through this crisis. I'm going to talk about that briefly, but I'm not going to be able to cover it. Obviously, it's not the law yet. The SBA and the SBDC will be very much involved with the process for obtaining uh, that kind of, of financial support and relief. So the people on the, that are on this call with me will be excellent sources. And if you have questions as we go forward, we'll be analyzing this law for our clients as well. But unfortunately, they did not get that done uh, yesterday or the day before as we'd hoped. So we cannot cover that in great detail today. Uh, just so that we have a little context here, this, this is me for those of you who I haven't met before. As Maria said, I do a, a tremendous amount of legal work for companies and employers out uh, throughout the state of Kansas. So I hope a lot of my, my friends and clients are on the call today and, and look forward to, to working with anybody who's new. Uh, what I'm going to do is try and cover the COVID basics, what's, what's going on, the latest on, on some of the science, practical workplace guidance, the brand new Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which I believe everybody on this call, if you have fewer than 500 employees, you will be covered by this unless there's a possibility you get accepted out of that if, if coverage under this law would, would, would place your business at jeopardy. So I'm going to cover that in some detail because that would apply to all of you and it is brand new. And then I'm going to try and cover some of the questions that I've been getting from my clients throughout this, this crisis that we're dealing with and, and, and deal with that and spend a little time, not an excessive amount of time, talking about the OSHA impact. As we go through the program, I'm going to do my best at the end to cover the questions that you might have. Quite frankly, I did a program like this yesterday that had about, about 3,000 attendees, and they had 500 questions. We could not cover all those questions in, a, in an hour and a half program. So I, I will do my best on the call as we get those, and Maria, I think, will be funneling those to me uh, at the end or as we go along if there's one that we need to address. Uh, but I will do my best to try and cover those in the time that we have with the understanding that I do have another program like this that starts at noon and then another one like this that, that starts at uh, 3 o'clock where I'm trying to cover employers all over the country because this is an emergency and they need the advice now, so trying to get it covered. So I hope you understand that. I just might not be able to get to it all today. What, what we're telling most people, based on the science, 
and based on the current economic situations that we're all dealing with is you should expect some level of disruption for the next 12 months. Whether you have a major disruption because you have your day one with an employee who tests positive or, or has the symptoms and you've got to go into some sort of unique operating mode at your place of business for a while and there you're severely disrupted or whether you're just dealing with a decline in your business due to uh, COVID-19 or whether you're dealing with what you do when you've got your employees who call in absence starting April 2nd because they can take paid FMLA leave under this, under these new laws. We're all going to have different levels of impact on it. And that is why every call I feel that it's a new and unique challenge that I'm dealing with because I really have to understand my client's business, get to know what their unique challenges are, and then try to fit their problems into the multitude of laws that we're dealing with uh, that we're going to try and go through today. But in general, this whole flattening the curve and social distancing may not mean that we get through this crisis without a significant portion of the population that get this illness. And if we do, we may not have the big wave coming in like a tsunami. That's what we're trying to avoid now. We will just have successive small waves of outbreaks of the illness that comes in uh, so, that, so that we just have to deal with it. This illness is going to be around until a vaccine is developed, which they're saying is 12 to 18 months away, until or until the world and the U.S. develops a herd resistance, which would mean a herd resistance is based on 80% of a population having been exposed and developing the immunity to the condition. Obviously, we want to, we want to avoid that uh, or at least spread that out significantly. But that is why this crisis isn't going to be one that we get to Easter, as some are saying, get through 14 days and the world's going to be going back to normal. We really need to have a plan on what we're going to do, uh, both health-wise and economically, over the next 12 months. Uh, the analogy I've been using as we talk about it is, is this is a gopher and the snake for all of us. we got to survive and get past this initial bubble that we're going to be in and then plan our business and our future based on what laws and what economic relief is available to us as we get to the other side of that crisis. And, and that is a lot about what we're going to try and cover today. What I'm telling my, my clients is, is, is you can't have a plan today that you just plug it and play it and it's going to work for the next 12 months. You could have a plan today that you think is fine. Tomorrow, one of your employee tests positive or is in contact with somebody, and now what do you do for your operation? Do you go to a full quarantine for 14 days? Probably not. Do you do a partial quarantine where that person is sent home? Anybody they had direct contact with is sent home. You sanitize your, work, your workplace, and you continue operating as much as, as possible? Probably so. As the law may change, you might have to change your plan. So everything we talk about today, uh, keep in mind it, it's just a roadmap. You're going to have to maybe take a few diversions along the way with your business as we go through it and as the rules and the laws and things change. Uh, they've, they've likened it to whack-a-mole. Right now the moles that we're trying to whack as a country are in the big metropolitan areas of New York, Seattle. You're going to soon hear about major crises and major uh, death rates, unfortunately, in Los Angeles and San Francisco. Uh, but, but thankfully, most people on this call are, call are immune to that. But at some point, it may came, come to your area, and you'll have to figure out how we deal with it based on this guidance. As we go through the day today, I do want to point out that there are some fantastic websites out there that if you have basic questions on these things, you should consult. The CDC is probably the best website for what do you do if you – have questions about the virus itself. What do you do if an employee tests positive in terms of, of making your workplace as safe as possible? You will see there's guidance on there that you send the employee home for 14 days. It is total legal to do that. If you've got employees that have traveled to certain areas, as you know, in the state of Kansas, the governor has said if they come back from certain areas which are listed on the Kansas website, you should tell them they don't come back to work for 14 days for you. Uh, until they get through a quarantine period. So there's fantastic guidance on what you do if you have your day one or you are concerned about your day one with somebody who may be testing positive on that. The law that we're getting ready to talk about, last night they added a new Q&A to the website. So most of these Q&As have already been incorporated in there. 
But when you see four bullets down on this slide, the doc, the, the website, I, I added it on here with the questions under the Families First Corona Response Act. A lot of those are on there, but again, I tried to answer those in the program. The reason I put that, that uh, click on there is they're going to be updating that as we go through and we get more guidance under these new laws. So that is something you can always reach back to if you do not have employment counselor, you can't reach me or whatever, as this changes to see if, if there's a unique aspect on how it applies to your business. OSHA.gov is good. Uh, if your operation has people in many states, that next site below it is tracking the various legal changes that are occurring in different states. So, for example, if your state that you might be have an employee in is waiving the unemployment waiting period, if you're going to have to lay somebody off, you can track and see if they might get those benefits for that. Uh, so, so that kind of stuff will be available. Uh, by the way, I, I haven't tracked the Q&As, and I should have said this up front, so I apologize for not doing that. All of these PowerPoint slides will be available to everybody on this program. I think uh, that Maria or Paul will make those available directly. If not, you can send me an email, and I can email these to you as well. So these are the websites that you can be monitoring. At the very bottom is our firm website. We have, we have developed a coronavirus response task force, and we've got a coronavirus link that is, we are just sending update after update as things change. And you can go to our firm website, and all of these ones I've cited, we've, we've con connected links to these, these, all these other places. So we're really trying to be a catch-all uh, resource for small businesses and other businesses that if you go there, you can click, click and get the questions answered. We update that constantly. Uh, we sent over 20 bulletins out to clients in, in unique industries or in, with unique questions yesterday, and then we populate those to our website so you can grab all of that information if you do have questions with the understanding that I think ever, many of you on this call might have very unique questions that are specific to you. So really quickly where we are now, I'm not going to spend much time on this slide. Right now we are in a social distancing goal of, of snuffing this out. Uh, personal hygiene, six, six feet apart, don't uh, mo monitor areas where people might have access for 72 hours and sanitize those areas because the virus could live for that long. Gatherings of fewer than 10 people. Uh, shelter at home quarantines in some locales. I am currently in one of those, the four county area, including Johnson and Wyandotte in Kansas, and then the Kansas City, Missouri, and Jackson County is, is the one in our state. Wy or, uh, Wichita is doing some similar things down there. Uh, bars and the restaurants are obviously closed. If any of you are in that industry, they're on here, unless it's for takeout or, or delivery. Uh, travel restrictions are being imposed and, and the encouragement that we don't overstock. What should we be doing with our employees now? Uh, the main thing we've got to do is constantly keep our employees informed and reassured that we have a plan on getting through this crisis. They are going to be very, very worried about, am I going to keep my job? Am I at risk to health if, if I come to work? Those kinds of things, and I have, I have established for our office, I'm the only one that's reported into our office in Kansas City for the last two weeks. I've got everybody working remotely at home. And I know our offices all around the country are doing the same. So we've de developed communication structures to keep people informed and engaged so that we can alleviate those concerns as much as possible. If you are still operating, what, what are you recommend to be doing? Separate your employees, obviously, again, to the extent possible. Significantly enhance cleaning and sanitation. Uh, not really most PPE. Most of you should not have employees, depending on your industry and what they're doing wearing masks and stuff. That is not what this should be all about at this, this point. If you can have people work from home, obviously that is highly encouraged right now. If your technology allows it, uh, we sent everybody home with, off, with computers here. Uh, we set up Microsoft Teams so that we could have employees all on one kind of group that we keep everybody in touch. We're trying to do that as well. I'm going to talk a, a little bit when we get to the legal section here in a second about attendance, time off, and things you could do there as well. But what could you be doing if you are operating as we go through this first wave? Uh, here I want to focus on the compliance now if you go through your day one that I've talked about before. What are, is your plan? And, and again, if you need to talk about it after we get off this call, let me know. If you get an employee who has, has tested positive or has the symptoms. Or if they tell you, I spent an entire day with a client yesterday. That client notified me today that they have... Uh, been tested positive. That actually happened to our law firm, 
and we've had two lawyers go out in the quarantine for the 14 days of that period where we put them out. We talked to all employees in our office that they might have interacted with. If there was significant interaction, we also had those individuals go into a quarantine. We had our office space completely sanitized. Uh, any area that's, that hasn't had interaction with it for 72 hours should be good according to the guidelines. So those are the kind of things you will need to, to do as you're, you're going through it. You will also need a plan for dealing with your at-risk employees. Many of you, if you haven't already, are going to get questions from somebody who is in the, the, the more at-risk age groups or has a health condition personally or a family member with a health condition saying, is it okay if I just stay home for this time period? And you're going to have to decide what you do. You may say, yes, I can put you on a furlough, and you can stay at home, in which case if you, you can't allow them to work remote because your business just doesn't allow and that what they do doesn't allow, they may be, be eligible to remain on your benefits. They may be eligible to draw unemployment at this new enhanced amount that's coming through the CARES Act. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Let me take a drink here. And they may be able, you may be able to decide if you <coughs> excuse me, continue paying them during this time. Or they go unpaid if you go unemployment, something like that. So you're going to have a lot of those questions that come up from your at-risk employees or others that want to, want to stay at home. How are you going to handle recent travelers? As I said earlier, in the state of Kansas, uh, we've got an order from our governor that if people go to certain locations, which you can see right now it's four counties in Colorado, uh, Seattle, New York, uh, those are, are high-risk places. You're supposed to tell those employees they need to quarantine at home for 14 days. And if they come back with no symptoms, then they're fine. Uh, those are the things that, that we are currently under. For those of you who are not coming to me from, say, Wyandotte or Johnson County uh, here in Kansas, where we're, we're under a work-from-home or a, a uh, let's not go out in public for the time being. So what are we going to do? Uh, if you're at a shelter from home order like those two counties I mentioned that I know under, there are multiple exceptions for those who are essential businesses. I, I, I've been working with several small businesses here in our area that are part of the critical infrastructure. They make plastic components that are being used to make ventilators. Obviously, it doesn't get any more critical than that. They get to and need to be coming to work. I work with a huge number of veterinary uh, organizations. And those veterinary organizations are considered essential providers as well, even though they're not providing, obviously, health care to humans. So even if you get a shelter-from-home order that is statewide in Kansas, which I hope we don't have, I hope we just don't go through that, but if we do, check to see if your business is essential, and if so, you could ask your employees to continue coming to work. Oftentimes, I've been getting questions from, if that is the case, do they have to have a letter saying they could come to the work? The answer is that is no. Uh, so far in Johnson and Wyandotte County, there is no letter requirement showing that you work at a place that's considered essential. Uh, the police are not pulling people over as they're driving in. Would it be something that you could consider just with a simple letter saying, I work at XYZ company. We have been deemed essential by uh, the four core, core four as they call it here in the Kansas City area. And so I'm going to work. You could do that, but you don't need to. If you can't operate at all. How are you going to handle layoffs or furloughs? Uh, how are you going to cover your business? Can't help you with that as much here uh, because that's something you're going to have to think about with your own thing. How are you doing things like mail orders, delivery, security? All of those are items you're going to have to think about to keep your place operating. The subsequent waves that are coming, and the big one I'm about to talk about is a wave that's going to hit April 2nd. How are you going to staff once we go into these new laws that apply to, I believe, everybody on this call, and you will be able to see the qualifying if it doesn't. You are going to have many employees that are going to take time off. Uh, how, do you, how do you staff during that? If you are one of those that is going to have to go through layoffs because your business just can't make it, and the CARES Act, which you're going to see coming into law over the next uh, 24 to 48 hours, might have a significant impact on whether you do lay somebody off or furlough them. Uh, those kind of things are going to be out there, but that is something that you might have to ask, and every client is different. I've been talking to everyone if they say, okay, we're thinking about a furlough, we're thinking about a layoff, what should we do here? Should we reduce hours? Should we furlough people? 
Should we lay people off? Should we close the doors entirely? What can we do with regard to unemployment? What can we do with regard to health insurance? What can we do with regard to use of our PTO? All of these are very good questions that you will be asking yourself if we do go into a shelter at home in your area, or you just need to, to uh, temporarily suspend your operations because your business has disappeared. Talk to your lawyers about that if you're really going down those, those positions uh, so, so that you can really figure out what's best in you, for your unique business concerns because yours could be completely different than everybody else's. If you're a restaurant, you know, you may not be able to make it. You may have to temporarily close if you're not getting the kind of, of uh, takeout and, and delivery orders. If you're in, the, in a manufacturing and you've got to provide critical things, you've got to figure out how we keep everything going. So it's all going to be different in all of these respects. So let's get into it right now. Last week, Congress passed the first law. I'm going to start covering all of the new laws and the old laws that apply to your situations as employers. But last week, Congress passed what they call the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. It is an obligation on everybody that, ha that is covered under the law, and that basically means every single employer that has fewer than 500 employees is covered by that. Since this is through the Small Business Association and the SBDC, most of you are probably going to be in that category, and, and I would be very surprised if any of you are not. Uh, but what it's going to do is create a paid time off obligation that I will cover in 100% detail in a second for your employee. It does not make all aspects of the FMLA apply to you. So if you do not have more than 50 employees total, the rest of the Family and Medical Leave Act doesn't apply to you. It just creates this brand new obligation. The Department of Labor is getting ready to issue regulations. We do not have them yet. We did get guidance last night through a Q&A, which I told you is available in that link that I attached above to some of the questions, but again, I, I cover those in this program, so you shouldn't have to refer to that for the most part. Uh, but it is there. We are going to get more guidance from the Department of Labor shortly on, on different questions. Write this down. This law kicks in at midnight on April 1st, so really it becomes effective April 2nd. April 2 is the date that it applies. It expires and ceases to exist as a law at the end of this year. So this is all going to affect stuff over the next basically eight months, nine months on how you try to cover this issue, and then it will go away. So what does it cover? Employers with fewer than 500 employees are covered by this. If you're part of a larger corporation somehow, and like a subsidiary or something like that, that where you may hit the 500, you need to be talking with people that are in your corporate uh, umbrella to see if you have more than 500, but that again is highly unlikely here. In addition, the Secretary of Labor can exempt your businesses if you have fewer than 50 employees, if you can re demonstrate that providing the benefits I'm getting ready to talk about would jeopardize your business. That is going to be an extremely, extremely narrow exception. The main reason is 100% of what you pay employees under this thing are going to be reimbursed by the federal government. This is not going to cost you any money. However, if you can demonstrate to have employees that are absent from work, would mean you could not continue to operate. If they take leave under this, then that could be an instance, and I'll talk about that in a second. What is this law going to require you to do April 1st or April 2nd? Provide paid FMLA leave and paid sick days. Those are going to be two different things. So I'm going to cover them each in a second, but, but make a note on your thing. Paid FMLA is extremely narrow, extremely narrow, and 90% and of you might not ever have to do that. Paid sick days is more broad and is not, really designed to cover people that are exposed to the virus in some fashion. So you may very well have to do that, and you may see that. People who take this kind of leave, there's going to be prohibitions against terminating them and re restoring them to their prior job. As I said, there's a process where you're going to get all of the money you paid for people to take leave back to you uh, so that you do not have to, to cover that out of your own pockets. There is going to be a posting requirement. So between now and April 2nd, be aware that you need to log on to the Department of Labor website and download the poster that they're going to say have to be posted in all workplaces and put that up on the wall where you normally put posters. It isn't out yet. You can't do it yet. But, but be, be ready for that. 
This law is also going to provide for free testing if people suspect once we get enough test kits and enhanced unemployment grants to the states. So here's the small employer exception I talked about. If you're one of those businesses that believes providing this leave would jeopardize your organization, they last night issued this guidance on how you would go about doing that and what you should not do. This is all we've got so far, folks. So I wish I could give you more guidance on exactly what's out there, but this information came directly from that Q&A that is on that website I referenced above. There will be more information to follow, but this is all we've got right now on what you should or should not do if you believe you're gonna be in that category whose business would be jeopardized by providing these benefits that I'm gonna talk about. So let's talk about what this really means. The emergency paid FMLA lead, it becomes law on April 2nd. Any employee of yours who has worked for you for 30 days will be eligible to take this leave. They can take up to 12 weeks of job protected leave. This 12 weeks of leave, I apologize for the typo there and the uncertain but likely, uh, is going to be set aside if any of you are, are 50 employees or larger. If they've already taken FMLA leave for other events, that would reduce the amount that they could take for, for this event. Uh, so it is a total of 12 for all FMLA events for those of you who are larger and who are covered. There is a waiting period of 10 days that an employee could not get pay, but as you're going to see in a second, that's going to be coordinated with the paid sick days uh, title because there is some overlap here. And if they take paid sick days for the first 10 days, they could then take 10 weeks off for, for paid FMLA. Here is the pay rate. If they pay, take paid FMLA leave, they get paid at no less than two-thirds their usual pay for normally scheduled hours for that week. If they're a 40-hour employee, then they get two-thirds of their normal. If they're a part-time and only work 20 hours, then you do the math on, on however it would be based on how many hours they normally work. There is a pay cap. The total you would have to pay out per employee per day would be either the lesser of two-thirds their normal pay or $200. The max they could get per person would be $10,000. The law does not allow you to tell an employee, well, before we're going to put you out on paid FMLA, you have to use all of your vacation or your sick time or your personal days or however you accrue those kind of paid time off benefits. They have the legal right to take this leave first and preserve those kinds of benefits for later if they so choose. However, if they want to use paid vacation for that 10-day waiting period or something like that, you could allow them to do that. You just cannot force them to do this that as this kicks in. What is the qualifying event? And this is why this is so very, very narrow. This leave, the paid FMLA leave, is only if somebody cannot do their job, whether that's in person or at home. So if you say, hey, go work from home. Your job is, is my billing person or my accounting person. You can do that at home 100%. Go do it from home, and I expect you to keep working. You can tell them that. If for some reason they've got a lot of kids or something that would distract them and prevent them from being able to work, then we should talk about that. But in general, if they can do their job at home, you can say, I need you working. Do your job. You're not on leave. You're just working. But if they cannot do that because the kids have been kicked out of school, and that has happened for the rest of the school year here in Kansas, or their daycare or child care center is closed and won't take kids because of a COVID-19 emergency, such as we're in, because we're in a state of emergency in Kansas, and the governor has ordered people uh, to, to, to do these things, uh, you, these employees could take leave for this reason. Again, a very, very narrow event. It is not for other FMLA events. It is just if the employee has to be at home to care for a child under 18, because the school closed or their daycare closed because of this emergency, as we know has happened. So that is paid FMLA leave. That is the first requirement. That is all summarized in this chart right here, that when you see emergency FMLA expansion, this is the leave due to a child care or school or daycare closes. And I tried to walk you through it visually on how this would all work on this chart. The chart doesn't add anything to what I said. It's just a way of looking at it and seeing it for those of you who are, are more visual than textual on how you analyze things. Next is the emergency paid sick leave law. These are the paid sick hours. This also becomes effective April 1. It also applies to the same size employers. However, everybody's eligible. 
You don't have to have worked for your company for 30 days. Everybody's eligible on day one after April 1. What, is the, what do people get? 80 hours of paid sick days or sick time or sick hours, however you do it. The pay is different here, however. Here, employees get the lesser of their regular rate of pay if they're out for their own illness or $511 per day up to a max of 5110 That's 10 days as you can do the math. If it's for something that isn't related to one of their own personal illness, such as you're going to see they're caring for others, then the max is different. They get $200, two-thirds rate of pay, up to $200, or a max of $2,000. Once again, you cannot reduce other paid time benefits for this. You can't make them use their vacation. You can't make them use their PTO. Right? And there is no carryover over these paid sick hours into 2021. If they need it in 2020, great. It's here for them but it doesn't continue into 2021. It does expire. What are the qualifying events? They are significantly different than the paid FMLA leave. This is designed to get relief to employers and employees who have people out because they are subject to a quarantine. In the Kansas City area, we are subject to a quarantine or isolation order. So as of April 1, if your employees have to stay home, then they could get paid sick time because they are subject to a quarantine order. And they could draw their pay, as I just outlined it, for, the, for 80 hours worth for full-time and, and whatever the part-time would be. They are also eligible for this in other areas of the state, for example, if they are advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine. If they are told they were, that they've got the symptoms and they need to go home and there's no test available and you need to stay at home and self-quarantine, then they can get paid the sick days for this. Alternatively, if an employee is experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and is seeking medical diagnosis, going to the doctor, hey, I've got the fever, I've got uh, a cough, I've got shortness of breath, I need to take time off to go get medical attention, they can take those time off and get paid this amount. Those are the first three that are covered by the higher level of reimbursement, the $511 amount. That's an employee seeking time off because they have their own situation. The next ones are if they are caring for somebody. So if an employee needs to take time off uh, because they're caring for somebody uh, or somebody who has a healthcare provider is said to self-quarantine like a child or somebody, then they get to take that time off. This one does not have to be a child though, by the way, if they have an elderly parent or somebody with a health condition, if they're, they have to take time off to care for that individual, they, they could take it for them as well. Again, if they're doing that, then is it, it is at the lower amount of $200 per day as opposed to the higher amount of $511 today. The next item is the one that overlaps with the paid FMLA. This is if a child is kicked out of school because the school is closed, as we know in Kansas is happening, or if the daycare provider is closed, that would also count for these paid sick hours, and they could take that paid for those first two weeks or 80 hours here, and then they can roll that to paid FMLA leave if it continues to be a need for leave for them. Uh, the last one is if the Secretary of Labor says we've got this unique event coming up, so we're going to issue more. This one is more of a catch-all if, if the Secretary of Labor does something. So just wait, and that, that's one you might have uh, uh, further guidance on if that were to pop up. But those are the two new laws that have, have just become effective or, or actually will become effective April 1. So not now, but be prepared for that. What is your day one plan if you've got employees that are going to be able to take paid leave or have one of these qualified events to pay, take paid sick hours? Uh, how are you going to do that, cover that pay through your, your payroll system? How are you going to do that to track what you provide so you can then get reimbursed or, or not pay that amount? Same visual that we had here. This is the chart for uh, the paid sick hours or sick leave as opposed to paid FMLA for the two weeks that hopefully those of you that are visual could, could walk through that pretty easily. Here's the financial assistance, folks. Here is what you can get reimbursed. It's the pay time off is 100% <clears throat> refundable, <clears throat> excuse me, through tax credits. So the way they're saying you're doing that is you would subtract whatever amount you owe from your payroll taxes, the amount that you've paid in paid sick leave. So if, if for this period of time, your next payroll, you owe $8,000 in payroll taxes, but you paid $5,000 in paid benefits under this law, all you would pay to the IRS right now is 3,000. 
they're doing that so that it's a real quick turn of things so that you get the money immediately back and don't have to to apply for some sort of reimbursement through the IRS, et cetera, to do that. However, if you've paid out more in leave than you would get back through the payroll by not paying that, then there is a way that you're going to be able to get an expedited refund of that amount from the, from the IRS. It's supposed to be available within two weeks. So the financial burdens of this law should be minimal. You need to start talking to your accountants about this as immediately if you think you're going to have issues with getting that turnaround and cash flow. Uh, but, but this is not, it is designed to be a non-financial event for most employers. Could it be a hardship if you've got more employees out on leave? and you have to plan how you do your business, absolutely, without a doubt, that could occur. But financially, this should be fairly seamless. So, so I'm going to move on now in the next time that we've got and try to cover the other laws in, in, in a lot of the common questions that I am getting from my clients on how do we do, deal with this various stuff that, that, that is coming up with this crisis. I'm going to try, and, and again, once we get to the end here, and I apologize for that, uh, I'm going to uh, try and kick this over so that so that Maria or Paul can get me whatever questions are coming in as we go along and answer those. Uh, so so stay tuned for that as well. The, one of the biggest questions I'm getting, and I, and for most people on this this call, it should not apply to you. What if we're going to close or lay off people for six months? Uh, hopefully, with the CARES Act, that is going to release the pressure on businesses so this doesn't apply. But for almost everybody on this call. The Warren Act does not apply to you because you're too small, and you're not going to be having a layoff of more than uh, six months, even if it does. So I am not going to spend much time on this because I don't think this is going to be a Warren event for most of you. And by the way, Warren is that notice that you have to give employees if you are going to close. So I am not going to talk about that much more. If you think this is going to have long-term impacts and you might have that situation, then you're going to need to be talking to your counsel about this situation. Again, highly unlikely. However, if you are going to have to suspend your operations, and I hope that's not the case, or if you're going to have to lay people off or furlough them, and the difference between a furlough and a layoff is typically furlough just means, hey, guys, until further notice, I don't need you reporting to work, but I'm going to keep you on my payroll. The good thing about that is, you might not have to issue COBRA and have their health insurance. It also may allow them to be taking advantage of these paid FMLA events that we just talked about here. So many of my clients are electing to furlough people as opposed to terminating them or laying them off so that you maintain the, the relationship with your employees. They still are eligible to go out and get unemployment benefits if you do that. Uh, but, but you may not have to, to COBRA them for their health insurance if you provide health insurance to them. Big word of advice here. If you are furloughing or laying employees off, coordinate with your health insurance provider and talk to them about what impact this will have on your employees. Are they, do they have to be COBRA? Probably not, but some of your health care plans may be different. So big word of advice, if you are going to have to lay people off or furlough them and reduce their hours, talk to your health insurance provider about what impact that has on their health insurance coverage. If you are union, which I doubt there are veteran in this call, so I'm not going to talk about that. If you're union, give me a call and you're planning on doing something, you're going to have to update that. If you're laying people off, the discrimination laws would apply and say, hey, you can't lay off the old people, you can't lay off the women. Everything that you would normally go through if you have a layoff, you have to think about that as well. The very great news that we've got if you're going to be going through layoffs is the unemployment benefits are going to be significantly enhanced under the CARES law and under Kansas state law. So you're going to see that, that we are going to be able to try and maintain the economic viability of our employees uh, through this process if worst case scenario is you do have to go through a layoff. So let's talk about if you have to send somebody home. Do you have to pay people? If, you, if they're not exempt hourly people and you have to stay them home, send them home because you just don't have any work for them, for example, and there's, you don't have something you could do to keep them working, then you don't have to pay, pay them for those hours worked. The hourly people, you just don't have to do that. If they're exempt salaried employees, though, there are some rules about that. Uh, if they don't work any time, if you have them laid off for an entire work week, 
or furloughed, you would not owe them any of their salary for that work week. And that is a work week specific issue, not a calendar week issue. And if you have questions about what that means, then we need to talk about that. If you're going to say, hey, rather than uh, lay you off, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have you work for three days a week, and for the other two days, you can uh, use your PTO to supplement that. That is okay as well. And if they run out of PTO and you're having them work three days, then we do have an issue that you couldn't reduce their salary. You would have to reinstate them to their full salary or lay them off for a full work week after that, if that is a route you go. Again, keep in mind this whole CARES Act thing is designed for you to keep people at their full salary potentially and then get reimbursed from that through an SBA loan so you don't have people losing these economic incomes. So monitor, that's why I say, sorry about those interruptions, folks, I just get a lot of calls. Uh, monitor the CARES Act and see if that not laying somebody off or not furloughing people is an alternative for you so that you could then keep them at work and then get the money back. Other employers are doing things like, what if we just want to change their salary? This is gonna have a long-term impact on their business. Our business model and what we do provides for direct interactions with the public. We simply can't do anything because the public is all staying at home. Uh, if the CARES Act doesn't provide relief, you could consider something with your salaried people of saying, okay, going forward, for the time being, we are gonna convert you to hourly. And until we get through this crisis, you're no longer salaried, you're paid hourly just like everybody else, and you're gonna get your regular salary divided by 2080 or however you would do that math. Or you could say, we're gonna keep you salaried and you're gonna just continue to need to work as needed, but we're gonna reduce the salary to 80% or 60% of what you used to pay going forward. And until this crisis ends, your salary is gonna be the new amount. Now it needs to be above the, the minimum threshold for the white collar exemptions. And again, we can cover that in more detail if you have those questions, but there are options for you if you have to send people home and the CARES Act doesn't provide the relief you would need to keep them at work. So I'm gonna move on to the FMLA. I, I'm not gonna spend much time here because I think most of the people on this call do have fewer than 50 employees. If you do have 50 or more employees, the other aspects of the FMLA would apply. So if they need to take the paid FMLA leave because it's one of the qualifying events we just talked about, under the, the, or the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act, then they could take their paid portion. And then if they continue to have a, a serious health condition that is covered by the FMLA, then you may have to provide them with unpaid leave as well. So for example, I have had multiple employees call, or employers call, I've got an employee who has severe anxiety and they are terrified about getting this illness and so they want to take leave right now so that they don't come to work and get exposed to that. Is that a qualifying event for FMLA leave? And the short answer to that is if their doctor says this situation is triggering a flare up in their severe anxiety and they can't come to work, then yes, they may very well have FMLA leave where they could stay at home. Now it might be unpaid, because it doesn't qualify under the law, but, but they could take that time off. Keep track of that, uh, particularly uh, as we go through this. I think it's gonna be very, very limited for people on this call uh, but, but monitor that as we go. If you have employees in other states, be aware, Kansas doesn't, but other states such as California have very, very detailed FMLA laws that would apply different, different rules as well. Can an employee stay home under FMLA leave to avoid getting it? Generally, this is not an excused reason unless somebody, as I said, is, is, has a, a, a an acute health, health condition already that this co could cause a flare up. So no, if somebody just wants to stay home, for the most part, you can say, I need you at work, friend. I gotta have you here. I'm sorry, but I need you here. You cannot take leave and you cannot be absent from work. It would just be considered an unexcused absence. Now, I encourage you not to do that. I encourage you to be as, as flexible as possible, but every, all your businesses are different, so I'm not gonna tell you you cannot do something if you've got a business need to do it and an employee doesn't have a legitimate reason not to come to work. It's just based on, on their concern or fear. If you've got an 80-year-old employee who has COPD and is concerned about coming to work because your business involves direct interface with the, with the, the public, then hey, I, I think you gotta really be cautious about just telling no to that employee because uh, it's not just about the law, it's about doing what's right sometimes, but I'm not gonna preach to you about that. You've gotta decide how you do that for your business and every business is different. Is a positive test for COVID-19 a disability into the ADA? Probably not. 
again, if it, if it exacerbates an underlying health condition, then it could be. Uh, but in general, this isn't going to be an ADA thing uh, that you have to worry about providing sort of accommodations for people if they have an event. The good news is if, if somebody does have a, a COVID-19 exposure or test positive and, and they get through it, it, they should be through it in, in two to three weeks or four weeks, and, and it won't be a long-term disability anyway. Uh, what if we have an employee who comes to work with symptoms? Is it legal? Or if they've traveled to a high-risk location, can we send them home to work? The law says absolutely yes. You do not have to let somebody come back to work if they've got symptoms or if they've traveled to a place that's a high risk. You can tell them, nope, you're not coming back for 14 days. You can also ask for a doctor's note before they return to work. So we're okay in Kansas doing that, Missouri doing that, our surrounding states doing that. Uh, you can also send home other employees that they've had contact with. As I said, we had an exposure here in our office. Uh, we sent the lawyer home who worked with that person. We sent the legal assistant home who that, that lawyer then spent the whole next day uh, in, in the rooms planning and doing stuff with. We want to try and avoid panic and not scare everybody in your office and try to reassure them that we're sending home those that, that are situation and telling them, look, if you've got a high-risk situation and you're really concerned, let's have a conversation about it. But in general, we did what we need to as an employer. We sent those home that, that were exposed or had a first degree removed exposure and are we think our workplace is otherwise safe. Other guidance that I'm getting a lot of questions on. Uh, if an employee calls in sick, can you ask them questions like, are you having chills? Are you having a cough? Do you have shortness of breath? Do you have a fever? You can ask them the questions that relate to whether it's COVID-19 uh, likely. And that's why I put that information up front for those of you who have not seen it. It is not against the law to make those kind of medical inquiries that sometimes you can't make under the ADA. You can ask them about this. This information, by the way, are the exact question and answers word for word pulled off of the EEOC website that I cited to you above that you can go and get as well. There's additional questions by the EEOC. <laughs> when may an employer take a, a body temperature? I've got a lot of clients that are doing this now. As employees report to work, they take their temperature. Two weeks ago, the answer to this would have been, that is illegal, you cannot do that. The EEOC changed its guidance to cover this situation. If you want to take employees' temperature before they come into your workplace, you can do so. The one requirement you're going to have to do is you're going to have to do that in a private setting. So you can't have a line of employees out the door and you test them one by one and say, okay, you can come to work, you go home. You gotta try and do that in a way that preserves their privacy. So in a separate room, something like that, but you legally can do that. Can we require if they have symptoms? Again, absolutely yes. When the employee returns to work, can you require a note? The answer is absolutely yes. There are a series of other questions that are available on this website, but those are the key ones for you to mostly be that I'm getting from a lot of my clients. Uh, are there discrimination issues? Unfortunately and thankfully, the president quit doing this. He was calling it the Chinese virus uh, as opposed to what it is, which is a nationwide pandemic. Uh, and we had a, I've had a lot of clients, none, none in Kansas, thankfully, that were discriminating because they somehow misunderstood that people of Asian descent were more likely to have that. The EEOC said they are really going to be looking seriously at any kind of discrimination brought against peace, people under this circumstance. So that is obvious to all of us, and I don't believe anybody on this call would ever do that, but I'm pointing that out to everybody because this is directly from the EEOC. What about workers' comp? Will you get workers' comp claims if somebody says, I got exposed to this at work? In Kansas, and in most places in Kansas, we are not enough of a hot spot that somebody could try to make the claim that they got it at work. It is possible, however, if you have an employee who gets it, that they could make that assertion, and you'll have to go through your normal health care providers, or your workers' comp providers, excuse me. Uh, but, but in most places, uh, I think this is going to be a low-risk issue in Kansas, but I have got, had several people ask that question in the, my healthcare clients in Kansas, particularly those on the east side of the state here where I am, where we are getting a lot, unfortunately, the hospitals are starting to spike up in people that are reporting, and the healthcare providers are starting, and their employees are starting to be more concerned about that issue. But, but for most people on this call, I think that's a minimum risk. What is OSHA requiring on this thing? OSHA is taking a very, very limited role in this for the most part. If we think due to the specific nature of your health places, and for the most part, that's going to be healthcare at this time, 
uh, then you do have to fur furnish under the general duty clause a workplace that is free from recognized hazards. If you have somebody on your day one that tests positive, then yes, you may very well have to go take extensive measures to sanitize your workplace if you are going to ask employees to come back to that workplace. That's the 72-hour rule I mentioned earlier. This virus can survive for up to 72 hours, they're saying, on hard surfaces. So would that mean a complete wipe down with, with, with Clorox and, and the right kind of, of, of sanitizing wipes of workplaces? By all means, yes, you could be required to do that. Uh, so, so that is something that, that if you have an exposure, you may have employees react to that. Uh, if, you're, if you're doing this, if you're continuing to operate, uh, YOSHA has issued guidelines with the, the CDC. If you're a higher risk employer, uh, what can you do to maintain your operation? So this is one I urge you to go to the CDC and look at their guidelines. I did not want to try and summarize that here more than I did because that is such a significant issue that has come up and every employer is different. What can you be doing to promote uh, reduction in this kind of situation that we're dealing with? Uh, these are all the things that we're talking about here in your workplace. I talked about them briefly. Hand washing. If you're sick, stay at home. If you cough, cough into your elbow. Uh, don't use somebody else's desk. Don't use somebody else's phone. Uh, if you go to the common spaces, such as the, the cafeteria in your place, wipe it down when you leave. Uh, if you go out the door and have an access to a door handle that, that the public had access or other employees to, go back to your desk and, and hit yourself with hand wipe or wash your hands before you do that. Uh, that is the kind of thing that OSHA is telling people to do. Uh, communicate these rules as you do it. Uh, try and train your employees if you're changing stuff as you go along is what we're talking really about here. If you have an employee, and again, I'm, I'm going through these fairly quickly because I do want to get your questions and I will go beyond the one hour we have slotted for this to answer questions. Uh, but if you do have somebody that says, hey, I tested positive, it could be a OSHA require and avail it if they can trace it back to your workplace. So be prepared. Those kind of nuts and bolts things under OSHA would still apply if we're doing it. Uh, here is the one I'm hearing the most of. And this is what if you get an employee who says, I believe our workplace is compromised. I believe that I have a significant risk of exposure at my workplace. I am not coming in. I will not work. OSHA does provide protections under 11C to some employee to refuse to perform services if they have a, a, a reasonable belief that their workplace is hazardous and their employer has not taken appropriate steps to alleviate or reduce and remove that hazard. For 90% of the people on this call or more, that is not going to be something that is out there. Again, maybe with an elderly employee or somebody who's got a higher risk and they're, they're customer facing in such a way that they can't mean appropriate social distancing or whatever, maybe that could apply. Uh, but for most places, that just OSHA just is not going to prohibit you from telling employees you need to come to work. Uh, you've got that situation. So that is something that, that I've got a lot of questions on. The employee would have to prove all these things uh, as part of it. Part two of a series we started last week. Um, Tim Davis um, is a partner with Costanji Brooks Smith and Profit. Uh, last week, Tim conducted a webinar on a employer's guide to COVID-19. There's another aspect of this CARES Act that provides for payroll tax credits. So again, if you are not going through, the bottom bullet talks about it, if you're not going to go through a PPP process, you could use this one. You cannot do both. Uh, so, so this is an either or requirement. Don't forget that. So don't apply for these because if, if it's a lot lower money, you think ultimately for you, if you would get more through the PPP pro, or, of loans. So these are an either or. You can see on this slide uh, who is qualifying for this, what it's basically for here. It's a refundable payroll tax credit of up to 50% of your wages. Uh, and you can see it's up to 10,000 per employee, so it can be fairly significant. Uh, but, but many of you, if you do not qualify or do not want to take out a PPP loan, would have this available to you as well.
the last one I'll talk about here, what this one does, by the way, is it, it I, and I'm not going to go through this because I don't think it's going to apply to most of you, but, but this is how you would go about looking at the, the, the displayed payment of, of the payroll taxes so that you could see that process. I wanted to get it for you, but in the interest of what we've got time today and to try and get to questions, I'm not going to cover this aspect in great detail. The next part of this CARES Act is, is the unemployment that you've been hearing about. Uh, everybody should write down the number 488, $488. That's the maximum weekly benefit that is available to an employee who is who is laid off or furloughed or, or maybe totally lost their job as a right of this, a result of this cross crisis in the state of Kansas. On top of that 488, assuming they qualify for the maximum, and people may or may not, depending on how much you paid them and whether they're otherwise, how much they paid in during their base period, all the normal calculations that apply in Kansas. But whatever they're entitled to, whether it's $200 or $488, the federal government is going to add $600 a week to those employees who've lost their compensation until July 31st of 2020. That's basically four months of up to $1,088 an employee could draw for unemployment. In addition, the federal government put money in to let the states extend their normal payroll or normal unemployment losses up to a total of 39 weeks. Now, after July 31st, it wouldn't be at the enhanced $600 amount, but it still is an extra safety net if the, if the world hasn't changed and turned around uh, throughout the remainder of the year, essentially. Uh, the other thing it did is it did cover a lot of people who otherwise would never be entitled to unemployment. Self-employed, and you now have, have suffered a significant loss in your revenue. It, during your base period. So you would get significantly enhanced benefits if you are a self-employed person. I saw a question early in the, in the, before we got started on the webinar. What if you're a business owner and you are uh, W-2 yourself as also as an employee? You could count, if you're going for a paycheck uh, protection program loan, you, you would count your own wages up to $100,000 towards that loan and you could do that loan forgiveness for yourself as well, in part to pay yourself for your own wages. Likewise, if you're going to unemploy yourself because you're not going to be working as a result of this, and, and let's say your your business is a uh, what's a good example, a plumbing business, and you normally are, are 1099 or you you're self-employed, you can draw unemployment as well if you're going to be losing this. So so there's two different ways you can cover perhaps your own wages as a business. Again, talk to your, your lawyers and accountants about how you might be set up yourself. But, but there's ways that this pandemic assistance applies way beyond the definition of somebody who's tr traditionally uh, eligible for unemployment benefit. So I'm going to move on from that, and I'm going to move fairly quickly through this next part. I know we're scheduled to do this program for about an hour, but I will stay on the line and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can afterwards. So, so I want to switch over to the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. This is the program that we all covered before, and I believe that program was recorded for anybody who didn't participate in that last time so that you can go back and get the basics of that. But we've got some significant updates since then. The Department of Labor has issued some FAQs, which you can go to their website at www.ul.gov and see those FAQs, and they kind of walk through some pretty specific answers. Those FAQs were then even further supplemented in the new regulations. Those are about 200 pages and are written, unfortunately, mostly for lawyers and people to, to do. Uh, but you can also look at those regulations if you have specific questions and insomnia and want to bore yourself to sleep at night because they provide further guidance on, on that as well. In addition, at DOL.gov, every single employer that's covered under this law, which means you have fewer than 500 employees, was obligated to download and put the new poster up in their workplaces. If your employees are all working from home now because you're going to telework due to the Kansas shutdown, you're supposed to email them a copy of this poster. So everybody needs to have done that and be doing that now. That was supposed to go into effect as of yesterday. The, well, last week when we did this slide, I, be, I believe I used this, but this basically walks through the, the paid FMLA leave component of the Families First Coronavirus Response Act so that you could cover that. Keep in mind, this is the expanded FMLA leave if somebody needs leave due to care for a child who has been removed from school or on daycare. 
There have been some changes to that on the new regulations that I'll go over in a second. But this slide really kind of walks you through the basics if you have employees that, that are unable to come to work because they got to stay home and care, care for their kids. Amazingly, I've had dozens and dozens of calls from clients who are already experiencing this since it kicked in yesterday. If you think about it, if you've got employees with younger children and they want to stay home to care for them because they've been kicked out of school and they can't get daycare, they basically are going to get two-thirds of their pay for up to 12 weeks to stay home with their kids. So, so that is the one I am seeing the most, the very most requests already coming forward from, from clients of mine who are, are having issues with that. Also keep in mind that all of this money is still 100% paid by the federal government. So if you have employees doing that, you're supposed to be reducing whatever your payroll taxes are when you pay it. If your payroll taxes are less than the amount you're paying out in leave, the government's supposed to be cutting you a check for that amount, and they're, they're claiming they will get you that check within two to three weeks after your request. So that is the, the, some of the updates on this part of it. The other part, the emergency paid sick leave, is the element where they get two weeks of pay at either 100% of their wages, up to $511 a day, or uh, their, their regular rate of pay if it's less than $511 a day. As, as that's a pretty hefty wage, as you might imagine. If they're taking leave to care for someone other than themselves, which I'll cover in a little bit more detail because that did change as well, then they get two-thirds their rate of pay up to a maximum of $200 a day during this, this uh, sick day entitlement that they have. And obviously, this sick day entitlement is much broader than, than the leave to care for a child who's been removed from school. So, so that is the summary that I used last time. This slide did not change since we last spoke a few weeks ago. So what is this about? Here's where we've got some development. What are the qualifying events for the 80 hours of paid sick, sick time? And by the way, I do want to remind everybody that 80 hours is prorated if somebody's not a full-time employee, if they're a part-timer or something like that. The qualifying events for this are your employees could be out on leave if federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order has been put in place. That counts for what the governor did in the state of Kansas. So if you have, if you, the statewide in Kansas, as we all know, we're supposed to be a handling this, this shelter at home or whatever you call it, the order from our governor. So you might have employees right now that are staying home for that reason. They could apply for and get this paid sick leave during this time. If you have been deemed an essential business under the Kansas governor's order, and thus employees are coming to work, if they need leave for a qualifying reason, they would not get it for this because they are not subject to a local quarantine order right now because they have been deemed essential and are supposed to be at work. But if they need leave for one of the other things we're getting ready to talk about, and you're operating because you're an essential business, they could take leave for one of the next reasons. But right now, if you are not operating and your employees are uh, obviously then not considered essential and they're out, they could apply for it and get 80 hours of pay right now uh, for, for those of you that are not essential. The second thing we're looking at here, and by the way, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we did develop a firm as a law firm or a form as a firm for our clients to use so they can document people that have asked for this kind of leave and so that they can then use that to go back and get their money at, and, and verify why they needed the money back from the federal government. So that form is available to you as well uh, in the materials as part of this webinar. The other reason that is uh, somebody could take this 80 hours of paid six at time, this has been supplemented as well. And the unique one, this has always been, if a, if a healthcare provider said, you need to stay at home because I believe you've got COVID, that, that has always been covered. Uh, or you've got the symptoms, and, and I believe you need to get diagnosed and you need to stay at home. Uh, those things have always been covered. What's new is that parenthetical there. If a healthcare provider tells an employee, you've got a healthcare condition, you've got severe diabetes, you've got uh, COPD, You've got a heart condition. If you get this, you are extremely high risk of, of having a problem. So I am telling you, even though you currently have no symptoms, you have no reason to believe you've got COVID-19, I am telling you to stay at home. That person could take 80 hours of this paid sick time as well. 
and they would get it at their full pay up to the $511 mark. That is brand new. That is not how we thought this would be interpreted, but that is in the new regulations that came out yesterday. The other element, if somebody is experiencing the symptoms and seeking medical diagnosis, been covered all along. Uh, this next one, caring for an individual subject to the stay-at-home order uh, or that uh, has symptoms or, or has been advised to self-quarantine, all those things above. This is a, not for the employee's time. So this is to at the lower rate of pay, two-thirds, not their full pay, up to $200 a day. And what's changed here is that they've defined what a, a close family member is or if they're caring for an individual. So the individuals that people can stay home to care for isn't just some friend they know down the street. It has to be a close family member, spouse, parent, child, somebody like that, or somebody that they share living space with. So if they are not married, but they've got a, a significant other and they share living space, uh, that is somebody they could stay home to care for, uh, that they're sharing the living space with. So that is a, a definition of who they could apply for leave under this one. Next, there's been some, some changes in this, this provision if they're staying home to care for a child. I really believe this is the biggest uh, thing that we're going to get. This one over, is in red because it overlaps with the paid FMLA talked about above in the first slide. Uh, here, uh, they can stay home to care for the child, and they could stay and get 80 hours of their, of their pay at this, and then they could take an additional 10 weeks under the paid FMLA leave above for a total of 12 for that particular event. Here is where they've added some information for us. They say that they can only take this leave if there is not another suitable care provider to care for that child. So for example, if your employee says, hey, my child's been kicked out of school for the rest of the school year, I wanna take now through the end of May off, which was whatever the normal school year would be, to care for my child, and you know but that employee's spouse is a stay-at-home spouse and always provides care for their child. Well, you could say to that employee, well, look, I know your spouse is at home. I know you've got a family member that typically cares for these people. I know that person is suitable and otherwise could be doing it. I'm not going to grant you this leave because you've got somebody already available to do it. And they would somehow have to prove to you that that person is unavailable. So, so that is a, better than I thought it would be, and that definition is helpful. And then the last one is a catch-all. If, if the Health and Human Services says, hey, look, there's, there's very similar conditions to COVID-19 that if an employee is experiencing, we just assume they not come to work, uh, we'd assume they waited out, uh, then, then also they could get this paid sick time. That is the new emergency paid sick leave changes and in, in clarifications we've received since the law became effective. There's been a few different ways, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I really want to do want to pass it over and get some questions answered. They've given more guidance on how you calculate somebody's regular rate of pay for determining uh, what they get. Uh, their average rate of pay, they typically look back six months. They would include if you got commission employees, if you're a restaurant and you tip your employees out and you, you have cash tips that you count towards their wages, you would include all of that in what you would pay and be able to get reimbursement for. If they are part-time employees, you look at, at a certain average in a two-week period in the prior six months, and you could calculate it that way. Uh, so they did give some more guidance on that and how you would calculate that. Uh, once you calculate the regular rate of pay, uh, uh, this slide kind of kind of walks through determining your average for those people that move up and down. Uh, this slide talks about the stacking. I mentioned it briefly just a second ago. There is one thing under the paid sick leave and the paid family medical leave that overlaps, and that is taking time off to care for your child. So this slide is designed to walk you through an example. You get a total of two weeks for the paid sick time, up to 80 hours for all of the different things that you could take leave for. So if you get sick yourself and you use all, or if you have an employee who himself gets sick and uses all of his or her 80 hours for that, They've used it all. They don't get 80 for their own illness and then another 80 for another family member or whatever. It is a total of 80 uh, over the course between now and the end of 2020. However, if they are home because they have a child who is, whose school is closed or they can't get them into their daycare provider, 
they could take their 80 hours of leave under this law, the paid sick leave law, and then take another 10 weeks of leave under the paid FMLA law for a total of 12. They can't take two weeks here and then stack that, the F paid FMLA leave on top of that for a total of 14. Likewise, they have clarified a point that we were not sure about when the law came out. If somebody has already used their normal FMLA leave, if you're an employer that has more than 50 and you're covered by the Family and Medical Leave Act, and somebody has already used their 12 weeks of leave for something already covered traditionally under the Family and Medical Leave Act, they can't use any of this new paid sick leave, which is a long way of saying you get 12 weeks total of, of family and medical leave, whether part of it's the unpaid stuff that existed before or part of it's the new paid stuff that exists now. So that's how that works. Uh, going on, uh, documentation. When, when you get to the end of the day, the IRS is going to say, we are going to want proof that you used this for an appropriate reason, that you did pay these sick time employees for stuff that was covered, and that's the only way we're gonna make sure it was done appropriately. They may audit you, they may uh, do whatever. So keep your documentation. If you use that form that we generated to show that somebody applied for it, great. If you get a doctor's note from a doctor showing that the employee had COVID and need to be stay out for their 80 hours, great. If you get something in your school or your daycare saying that it's closed, or if it's on the website, print out that, take a screenshot and print out that website right now so you can prove that the school was closed. Keep that documentation in case the IRS looks for you to, to demonstrate what you needed by way of this paid leave. Uh, here's another interesting question that came up that, that the Department of Labor answered. And the question revolves around what happens if my business is closed? I, I couldn't keep operating. So I am not operating during this period. Or even if you could operate, now you can't operate because the government says you shouldn't be operating if, unless you're an essential business service and you close down as a result of that. Can my employees still take these paid sick days or paid FMLA leave while I am shut down? And they answered that question with a no. So if your employees are, are furloughed and you're not, you don't have them coming to work because you didn't need them, or your business is entirely closed during this process, you do not have to be paying these paid sick days. And in fact, you should not be paying them. In that instance, employees would go draw unemployment. And keep in mind, they'd be getting that enhanced unemployment, which includes the additional $600 from the feds. So for a lot of employees, this isn't a tremendous hardship unless they were fairly high compensated people, you know, that were we're making more than, you know, roughly fifty to $60,000 a year. Uh, if they're making le that much or less, the, the $1,000 a week is, is going to come pretty close to making it up for them. So that is how they've answered this question. What do we do if we've furloughed somebody or if we've closed entirely? Do we pay these paid sick days and sick leave? The answer to that is no. They've also provided additional guidance on, on what do we do in terms of continuing health coverage during this period. Uh, this slide, it covers that for you. Uh, typically, you would, you would keep the health insurance up if it's the paid FMLA leave or the paid sick leave, so you would not have a, a gap or lapse in coverage. Uh, so, so you've got that covered on there as well on how you're going to be covering your, your health insurance costs if somebody's out on one of these protected leaves. I'm going to talk about this, and then I think I'm about getting close to the end of the slides, but, but I, I, as I said, we'll start taking questions here in a second. We're up to close to 30, so not too bad. If you are a small business with fewer than 50 employees, it, this law has an exemption to say, you're so small, we cannot provide leave because uh, it would create a hardship. The regulations provide guidance on what you would have to show if you wanted to say we are not covered by this law. You'd have to show one of these three things, that providing this paid sick time off would, would be so expensive for you that you would not be able to operate. That's going to be very, very hard to do in that element unless you have a lot of people requesting leave and the, the, the lag in the money you would get from the federal government won't cover you and you just don't have the operational capital to survive. So that's going to be a pretty difficult one to meet, mainly because this is paid for by 100% by the federal government, 
and you should not have a problem getting the money back if you can carry the, the wages for a period of time. The second one is the employee being out from your business would create a significant hardship to you because of those employees specialized skills, knowledge of the business or responsibilities that they do. If that is a case, you could deny employees in that very unique category uh, the right to take leave. Likewise, it, or, so it doesn't have to be all of these things, it's obviously one of the three. There are not sufficient workers available, willing and qualified to do the work that you need and that requesting the leave would put you at a significant hardship. That is another reason you could say, look, we just don't have employees around to replace them. They don't have unique skills or abilities. We just don't have enough people around to replace them. I cannot have them gone. They've got to be here. And if that is the case, uh, then you could deny them the leave that we're talking about here. So they did provide some more guidance on that in the regulations on who would be able to accept out certain people from the bank. If there are any healthcare providers on this call today, meaning you operate a hospital, a clinic, a doctor's office, a, a nursing home, you know that you've got a separate exception that applies to you that you can and are expected to be continue and operate during this crisis and you would not have to provide leave to employees under this crisis if they need to be at work uh, for, for providing the services that you do. So that is something I, I did my best to keep it right in an hour to cover all of the stuff that I wanted to cover today. And now I don't know how we're gonna do it, whether Maria, you or Greg are going to do it uh, to field the questions, but how did you wanna start going through the questions? Hi, Tim. Um, I think the easiest way for now is I'll just start reading off the questions and we'll run through them and uh, mm -hmm. see how that works for you. When we run out of time, uh, then we'll take the list and try to get those answered the best we can afterwards and send them out to everyone. Does that work for you? Sounds great. The, the first one is, does this apply to local government and municipalities? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, Congress specifically said these new laws, the Family First uh, Coronavirus Response and, and the obligation to provide leave does apply to local governments and municipalities. I am not sure yet at this point if the reimbursement does as well. You may have to provide that out of your own tax dollars and pockets and then seek other ways to get help from the federal government on the money. But yes, the obligation to provide this leave does apply to local government municipalities. Okay. What about nonprofits, Tim? Yes, nonprofits as well. Okay. Um, nonprofits with, are employers under this law. With physicians that are limiting doctor's notes, what types of documentation are acceptable to determine whether a um, health condition is legitimate for both remote work and or FMLA leave? Okay, and Maria, you're cutting out a little bit on me. I don't know if you are for everybody else, but, but I understand your question and got it. Uh, the doctor's note requirement is still very fluid. We do anticipate getting further guidance on what we can require, but right now what we believe it is sufficient to say, to have a note from a doctor that says, this employee was at my office seeking treatment related to uh, symptoms that could have been coronavirus, and that's all it takes. It doesn't require a, a positive diagnosis. It just requires that they may have symptoms and they're going to seek treatment for, for such. So for the most part, the doctor's notes are gonna be much more limited and we just have to indicate that the employee was seeking medical advice and consultation related to coronavirus. In some instances, they do not have to visit the doctor. A lot of doctors are doing tele-advice right now as part of protecting their clinics from people coming in. So they, they seek diagnosis by the phone and then the doctor sends them a note saying, I discussed this issue with my client remotely, or my, my patient remotely, here it is. So it's basically gonna be a very simplified note from a doctor. If employees self-quarantine the week of March 16th, does this apply to them? Is it retroactive? Fantastic question. Uh, it is such a good question that the Department of Labor felt the need to answer that on the Q&A that is on that website that I provide you guidance to. The answer that they provided is no. If they self-quarantined earlier, you are, were under no obligation to pay them or have them be out on time. And importantly, if you did provide them with that time off, 
They still get to take more time off under the law if they have a qualifying event after, after April 1st. So, so anything that you did before April 1st does not in any way count towards what happens ap after April 1st. Okay. I have only three employees. Am I exempt from FMLA or do I need to provide this service and sick pay? I own an auto shop and don't offer sick or vacation pay to employees. Okay. Again, fantastic question. Short answer is yes. Uh, this law applies to any employer that has fewer than 500 employees. So you have to provide these new paid sick things that we've talked about on this program. You're not otherwise covered by the other FMLA stuff. But when it comes to these paid sick hours and paid sick FM or paid FMLA time, if you have an employee who needs to take time off for these reasons, you will have to provide the stuff I talked about under those new laws today. Now, possibly, could you qualify and try and get yourself set up as a small business that is exempt from it because it could have significant financial impacts or ability on the, uh, the long-term viability of your business? Yes, but you need to go through that process once it is set up by the government and that is not finalized yet. The next question is, can FMLA be taken on an intermittent basis? Excellent, fantastic question. Again, you guys are, 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 are tracking exactly what the Department of Labor is getting. Uh, and the answer to that is yes. So, so let's just say you, you take off uh, for two weeks to care for a, uh, a child who's been kicked out of, of their school. And then you get a flare up and down the road, you, you come back to work because now, now the school's out and, and they're doing whatever they do and they're not out of school anymore. And now your day daycare closes because you had an exposure and your kids kicked out again. So yes, it can be in the, on an intermittent basis for, for the paid FMLA component. For the paid sick leave or sick hours component, the 80 hours item also could be. You could have an employee who needs to go get tested right now because they got an event and they need to take four hours off. And, and then they come back to work after they test negative. And then down the road, they got to take time off to care for somebody. So yes, both of these items, if, if you have a qualifying event, can be taken intermittently. How about employers that pay weekly draws plus commission and 1099 employees? Ooh, uh, well, if they're 1099, they're contractors. So, so they, they're treated differently. Weekly draws and commissions, uh, there is a special provision dealing with how you would determine the compensation for them. Uh, I, that is one that you need to talk uh, with your accountant or your, your firm about on how you do that. But in general, th they would look at a, a, a re respective or a representative payroll period of time, and they would then get the amounts based on that representative period, what the person kind of averages per week is the way I would describe it, is how they're looking at, at that kind of thing. So, so that is how they're calculating it. Uh, there's another provision there, by the way, under this Q&A, if somebody works a lot of overtime, would you factor that into their normal pay week? And the answer to that is yes as well. So you, you do have to, to, great question, because it does vary based on what people are actually doing, not just a straight 40-hour work week times whatever the rate would be. The rate for many of you could be different than just, just some straight up flat hourly rate. So great question. Um, in the entertainment industry, nightclubs, bars, things like that, um, you have employees, none of them are full-time. Do the guidelines for FMLA and sick leave apply to those businesses if your business was closed by civil authority on March 19th? Sounds like we've got somebody uh, from uh, the Kansas City area here <laughs> who's going through what, what we are here. Uh, short answer is, uh, this law, first off, doesn't differentiate between full-time and part-time. So if you only have part-time employees, you're still covered. So, so you absolutely uh, would still be covered by this law if, if your business is such that your business model means you've got 100 part-time employees and no full-time. So the short answer is yes, this does apply to you still, and uh, you would be covered employers but, but here's, here's a very interesting wrinkle that, that I, I don't know who this person is. It's, it's on a, if you have laid all of these employees off such that they are not working for you at this time, uh, when the law does become effective April 1, the law would not apply to those employees because they're not working. They're not actively there as opposed to, to, to active employees. So you may not be providing any of these paid benefits because they're, they've all been been laid off 
prior to the laws applying. Now, now one thing that, that you, you, we, you need to talk to your lawyer about is if you laid them off and, and said you're no longer working, then they are not covered as we're reading the law right now. They, they're, not, they're not eligible for these benefits. However, if you furloughed them and said, look, I'm not going to lay you off. I'm just going to cut your hours. You're going to remain to uh, be available as needed. And you're in the Kansas City area, which has gone through a – we're under quarantine now through mostly the end of April, most of April. Uh, that employee could then say, well, wait a minute. Now I am subject to not coming to work. I could use my 80 hours. It wouldn't be the other event uh, that we're talking about. Uh, but I – cause, cause unless they have kids. I mean, if they've got the kids out of school, I guess it could be the paid, paid sick time. Uh, but, but yes, you could have the situation where, depending on how you've removed them from your workplace, they would become eligible for this on April 1st because we're under that, that situation. On normal payroll deductions are for insurance, child support, are those taken from sick leave or the FMLA? Uh, short answer is still yes. Those, those would be uh yeah shoot i better i better I, i'm gonna i'm gonna have to table that question as well there is specific guidance on how you handle that that is one that the department of labor said they would be answering through the regulations because there might be some sort of formulaic approach to how you do that but the short answer is you would you would probably still be honoring the normal garnishment that would be out there but there's going to be guidance from that more specific so i'm going to table that until we get that guidance from the regulations which i hope will be at the end of this week or early next now, Tim, should chips be included in pay calculations for the first, the family first law? Should what be included? Tips. If somebody receives tips as part of their 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 um their position. Yeah, there's special guidance on this for tipped employees. So if you look at the Q, the, probably the best way to look at that right now is the Q and A that was issued from the uh, Department of Labor last night speaks very specifically to that issue. And uh, essentially they do try to look at tips as well. Okay, can local governments, so make, I'm sorry. No, yeah, there's a special rule for tipped employees uh, that, that you'd be looking at. Uh, and, and again, whoever that was, if you guys wanna try and chat later today on, on what that rule is, uh, I, I can pull that up, but I do not have that in front of me and I've never done the math myself in my head how that works. Okay. Can local governments make their employees exhaust their accrued time for COVID-19 exposure or when they are diagnosed with it and quarantined, or are they required to give additional time not dipping into what they're, they've already accrued when they are ordered to quarantine? Okay. In general, you cannot make them use their accruals before they use the benefits available under these new laws. Uh, what, what I do not know because this law, and I haven't, I haven't been talking to many public sector side folks, so I apologize for that. I have not looked at the law in depth that as, applies to, as it applies to the public sector, so I don't know if there's some sort of exclusion that would allow public sector people to make them use accruals. I, I do not believe that is the case. The, the way this whole law was written, it says throughout that you cannot force them to do that, and I have not seen in my review of it a couple times anything that comes to mind that says, public sector can carve that out and can make them use accruals. So I believe the answer to that is no, but, but I'll be, I think that is something I would want to follow up on as well, because I'm not positive. I haven't looked at it specifically for those sectors. Can employers lay off after April 1st? And if they do, do they still need to provide the new FMLA pay? Uh, short answer is yeah, there's nothing in these laws that say if you've got to close your operations that, that you, you, you cannot lay people off, or, or even if you're not closing the operations, if you're, if you're reducing. So the laws would say they do that. Once somebody is laid off, if they're not already on leave or getting these benefits, they would not be eligible for these benefits. Okay. Does the 500 employee designation for the FMLA regu regulations refer to the total employee count for a corporation with multiple locations, or is that determined by the number of employees at each individual facility? Yeah, um, the 500 employee per count for the purposes of this, these two new laws, whether you have more or less than 500, 
is not based on location. It's based entirely on the size of the corporation. So let's just say you're, you've got five locations, each with 150 employees at them. Clearly, when you add them all together, there would be over the 500 number. If they're all part of the same corporate subsidiary, such that, that they're, they're part of an umbrella corporation and uh, they all report up there and they're, they're really operated as a single enterprise, that's the legal test, then the, where the locations are don't make a difference. <clears throat> it's really how, <clears throat> pardon me, give me a long day, I'm losing my voice already. Uh, it's really whether you are a single enterprise from a legal standard, not where those locations are, and whether or not you're a single enterprise under that legal standard is something that would require a, a substantial conversation uh, with your attorneys. Okay. Um, in the hospitality industry, um, when you have employees and, or, or a hotel with limited housekeeping, they are hourly when needed, have a spa and salon, um, spas totally commission. Does the act have a guideline for part-time commission staff? Yeah, is, uh, what, we're, what we're talking about there is, uh, and really what we're, we're, we're dealing with, I, I'm not going to talk about the CARES Act. I don't know what it's going to do for, for, for that. But for the paid FMLA and the paid sick days law, what you really, what your question really asking about is how much would they get from this? If they're out on a uh, paid FMLA leave, how much do I pay them? There, the law does have a provision to calculate commissions and tips into what their regular rate would be so that you could be paying them full reimbursement for what they're out, not just what they were out on an hourly basis. And that is something that, that we would get very, very clearly uh, more guidance on from the Department of Labor over the next, hopefully, couple days. And Tim, in regard to municipalities and local governments who are seeking help for reimbursement, who is it that they would speak to about that? For reimbursement from the federal government? Correct. Uh, what, what you're dealing with there is, uh, I, I just don't know that right now myself. I apologize because I haven't looked at, at you, but, but I would start, I don't know what type of municipality we're talking about here, uh, but typically I would start by asking your, your local attorney. And most, of, most municipalities have a, an attorney that would apply, like, like, like that's on their payroll, like their, their city attorney or whatever the case may be, and, and they would be up to speed on that. But, but I, I can look at that. I just apologize. I haven't looked at that because I've been focusing on the private sector so much. I, I, I normally would know that answer, and I apologize for not, but if, I, if we can't get that answer to you after this call, then, then talk to your local attorneys who you normally get your advice from on this stuff, and they should know it as well. Tim, this one is in your area, and I think it's, it's a great outline. Um, they're in Johnson County. The business is not considered essential. Um, as of yesterday, employees cannot work. Um, Due to the stay-at-home order, can you kind of detail out what that first two weeks looks like? Um, assuming they don't have any kids at home, they're not ill, they have not been exposed, will they be paid 100% the first two weeks? Will they be paid for weeks three and beyond through these programs? And if so, at what rate? <coughs> yes, great question. Uh, anything that has happened up until April 1st, you, you just basically will ignore. They, the law does not become effective till April 1st. So after April 1st, when, when Johnson County, Kansas does uh, both become subject to this new law, that, that the family first coronavirus, it's hard to say, it's, a, it's not easy to, to have an acronym for, it, which would be providing the paid sick hours and obviously the stay-at-home quarantine order through, through the, uh, the, the county, the, the Johnson County. So at that time, they would become eligible for the full paid amount, the, the lesser of two thirds of their pay. Actually, let me work, work, work back and walk through that. They would get the greater of their full paycheck or $551 for 80 hours in Johnson County starting April 1. That's how it would work and then that would apply for or the, the 80 hours of time off, or if they're part-time, whatever their normal work week is, uh, for the next two work weeks after, or for the next 10 days after April 1, which would basically cover them at their pay through, uh, I guess, roughly 
whatever 10 days is of that, um, that period of time, 80, and I say 10 days, what really would be is through 80 hours. So 80 hours of pay continuation starting April 2nd. What if an employee um, chose to no longer work due to their concerns of the virus? They're not sick, they're just panicked and don't want to work. If, great question. Um, so uh, it, it, well, I'm gonna have to break it down. I apologize, this is gonna take a little time for everyone, but, but this question has come up multiple times with my own clients, so I wanna, I assume many of you have this. If you've got an employee, category one employee is somebody who is just perfectly healthy have no underlying health conditions. They're a younger person that is, uh, as we all know about this virus, is less likely to be subject to it, but they still don't want to come to work. Uh, that person would not qualify for any of the paid leave because their doctor's not telling them to stay at home because of a condition. That person, you could say, look, I'm operating. Our business, our business is essential, so we're operating. Otherwise, they wouldn't be operating in Kansas right now and the way it works. So you're operating. You've got a totally healthy person who has no reason to be out. You could say you need to come to work. And if not, you could do something as much as, as terminate them. Uh, or alternatively, you could say, look, I understand your concern. I'm going to try and operate based on the people who are willing to come to work. And so what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll put you on an indefinite leave. What that person could then do is, is get unemployment benefits in all likelihood. They, normally, when the, if there's work available, et cetera, they wouldn't be eligible for that. But under the example I just gave, you don't need them because you've got the work covered with others. You could put them on a layoff. It won't go against your unemployment rating, and they'll get the extra benefits. Now, the problem with that is everybody might be saying, well, why is Joe going to sit at home getting $1,000 a week to do nothing? I'm coming to work and busting my butt, and I'm only making $800, depending on what your wages are. You might have that kind of challenge to work through in that scenario. Uh, but bottom line is, if somebody is just healthy and doesn't want to come to work, you've got options. Now let's talk about employee number two, category number two. They've got a health condition, and their doctor says that person should not be coming to work because if they get this condition, they, they run a higher risk of dying. Or they're older, let's just say. They don't have a health condition, but they're older, and their doctor says don't do it. In that instance, you would have to provide up to the 80 hours of paid sick time because they do fit into that new category that the regulations elaborated on yesterday. So person number two is somebody that the doctor says they shouldn't be coming to work. They've got an underlying health condition. They could qualify for that paid sick time. Person number three is, is somebody who is let's say the doctor doesn't say they've got it. Well, actually person number two could be person number three as well. Let's say that they're got a condition and the doctor says they shouldn't come to work. They get the 80 hours. In addition, that person may get a note from the doctor that says, this person has an underlying health condition that qualifies if you are FMLA covered, meaning you have more than 50 employees, et cetera, et cetera. Have, have, and that employees work for 1,250 hours in 12 months for you. I have seen already some doctors that are saying this person, because of their underlying health condition, it is an undue threat for them to come to work, so I want them out on FMLA leave. In that example, person number three would also get the first 80 hours paid because the doctors put them out, and then they may be eligible for 10 more weeks unpaid of FMLA leave. Again, we, we really got on a call like this, and when I don't know all the facts, that's the general way I think you would handle that, but I do encourage all of you to talk to your regular employment counsel about that very unique set of facts, because that is one area where the law is absolutely not certain, and, and I've talked with some other lawyers already who don't do employment law, who did not give that advice, and I think they're, they're giving, they're potentially committing malpractice because they're not walking through that FMLA component and possibly the ADA component, which applies to much smaller sized employers, the ADA you might have a situation where the employee says, I know I'm not eligible for FMLA, but I've got this underlying health condition, severe diabetes. Would you, as a reasonable accommodation, <coughs> excuse me, allow me to, to stay out of work until this crisis reduces? 
and you may have to consider that as an, uh, an accommodation if you're covered by the ADA as well. Again, those are very, very highly sophisticated analysis. It has to be drilled down to the employee, employee by employee level. So, so that's the basic advice I would give you, but that's one you want to talk to somebody about if you find yourself in that situation. Okay. Next Sorry, that was kind of a long answer for that question. That's all right. Thank you so much, Tim. I really appreciate your uh, information and, and your willingness to help us. Sounds good. Everybody take care. I'm going to sign off now, and I'm going to try and get my voice back, drink some water, and uh, and get ready for my next one. So. Uh, all Everybody right. take care. Be be very safe out there. And Maria, you in particular, I hope uh, hope you're feeling better. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye.